We're, Baruch Hashem, getting ready to complete the 13 principles. We've already, already covered 10 of them. The last one we covered was the one about how Akadosh Baruch Hu, God is aware of our thoughts. Not only is he aware of our thoughts, but he's also involved in everything that happens in this world. To the most minute detail. So it's not only a God who created the world and bailed out, as some would like to think. He's very much involved, he's very much around, and he's aware of everything. Aware of our thoughts, aware of our actions. And this is a very important principle, as we will see tonight. We will talk a little bit about free will, and that how that uh, is a very important part of that idea. If Hashem is aware of our thoughts of, and of our actions, that means our thoughts and our actions are important. That means we have a certain degree of independence. Otherwise, why does He need to be aware of our thoughts and actions? What difference does it make? And this is also a very good preparation to tonight's topic for next week's principle, which deals with reward and punishment, a very important part of of Judaism uh, discusses this idea that there is reward and punishment or basically we are held responsible, we are accountable for our actions. This is a temporary world and eventually in the world to come that is where one gets compensated for all his good deeds or has shalom, God forbid, you know, there is a tikkun. I prefer the word tikkun versus punishment where one needs to somehow pay for what he did in order to be cleansed of the sins. So I, I figured it's important to elaborate a little bit about this free will. Free will is a big topic in itself. Free will versus predetermination or predestiny or predestination. We've covered this quite a few times in the past. It's a very important topic. A lot of people are very confused as to what the borders are, free will and predestination. So let's just begin with a couple of questions. And one is, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if God is aware of everything, if He is involved, does His involvement in any way limit that free will, that independence that we're supposed to have? And in saying so, do I already imply that there is free will? Or perhaps many things are predetermined, predestined from the very start. And for those who've never heard about free will, what is exactly free will? So in the Torah Dosha, there are many, many examples, many verses, whether it's in the Hamishach Um Torah, in the five books of Moses, whether it's in the Tanakh. If one reads it, learns it, takes his time to, to really go through this incredible piece of work, a Bible, he will notice many examples of free will. Moshe Rabbeinu pretty much emphasizes this towards the end, and he says, listen, I give you choices. I'm giving you the choice between life and death, between the good and evil. Why is he saying it? Obviously, there are choices to be made. You have the choice. You have been given the ability to, de to decide between what kind of a life you want to have. And if you look at Parshat Bechukotai at the very beginning, Hashem makes it very clear. Listen, there's no two ways about it. In Bechukotai Telechu, if you follow my statutes, you will have one kind of lifestyle. You will have it good. You will have blessing. You will have rain on time. You will be prosperous. Everything will work out for you. You will have it easy, relatively. If you don't, then I'm going to have to remind you the hard way that you're not doing your job. After all, you do have a job. So it's up to you what kind of a life you want to have. So it's made very, very clear to us numerous times that depending on our actions, on our deeds, that is the type of life we will have. That is the type of relationship we will have with God. That will determine whether our enemies will hate us and wage war against us and give us a hard time or leave us alone and live in peace. And people don't realize it, but the trouble that we've been having throughout our history, throughout the diaspora, or even when we were in Israel, in our land, the many troubles that we've had from almost all our neighbors and all the cultures and civilizations is only because of our actions. There was obviously something wrong, something that we were not doing right. 
And this was one of Hashem's ways of letting us know, get your act together. By sending us prophets, by sending us our enemies, by leaving, leaving us in a, in a difficult predicament, whether it's uh, no rain for a couple years, or some other problems that we had to contend with, disease, famine, and all of that was a clear indication that Hashem is involved, Hashem is unhappy, and we better do something about it. There were always people, of course, who thought, oh, this is just El Nino and La Nina, you know, weather patterns, perhaps. You know, that is why, you know, this, uh, what are they calling it these days? It's warming up. Global warming. Global warming, you know. Yes, there is such a thing as, as global warming, perhaps. There are things that, uh, that are affected by mankind. You know, there, there is ab- obviously a lot going on today in the 2021st century that was not going on in the past that may have something to do with the weather. But that's not the main thing. Hashem is still the boss, he's still in charge, and he still calls the shots, as they say in English, everywhere, irrespective of what it is, in all areas, whether it's war or famine or rain, economy and the like. So from the Torah Dosha, we see very clearly that our actions do make a difference. Basically, therefore, what free will really means is that we have responsibility. We're accountable. We will be held accountable for our actions because we have been given this ability. When HaKadosh Baruch created man, he created man very, very different than animal. In what way? In that he gave him a neshama. He blew into his nostrils a spirit of life, and that's the neshama. That is something divine. That is something from above. That is what distinguishes us from animals. It's not so much the ability of speech, because even parrots know how to talk, or can mimic, or imitate you. So it's not so much the power of speech, even though it is true that the power of speech that man has is definitely of a higher quality than anything else in this world. But this power of communication is endowed to him through his neshama, through that, that which we call the soul in English, that is something from above and not from below. So this free will means it implies responsibility, it implies that, that it is through this key called chirach of shit that we will have either the sachar, the reward, or the punishment. In other words, sachar ve'onesh, this important principle called reward and punishment, is actually completely dependent on something called bechira, on free will. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. If we're all we, all we are are instincts, if all our actions are automatic, or they're somehow predetermined before, then what's the purpose of having sachar ve'onesh? How could you say that's one of the principles of the Torah? How could we be blamed for our wrongdoings? If we were born like that, like some people like to claim, oh, I was born like that. Then the, 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 what is the Torah for? The, what is the Sahar Ha'onesh? If there's no way to change? Even if you're born like that, perhaps you can change. Oh no, I can't change. Well, that's what some people would like to think. So free will means that we are held accountable because we have the ability to exercise that free will to make decisions for right or for wrong. And we have, of course, an advantage. This free will reminds us that we are not animals, that we are actually above animals, that we can actually, through this free will, become more and more like our maker. We can resemble him in many, many ways. And of course, that is another topic for another time on how one can resemble his maker. We spoke a little bit about that when we gave the series about the midot, character. Character, character refinement, where one can elevate himself to higher levels of spirituality by refining his character, by working on himself to be more of a giver instead of a taker. These are some of the ways where he becomes more like his maker, like the creator, instead of just an animal who's interested in his own selfish needs. Just to quote to you a little bit of what is written about free will, the Rambam makes it very clear. Remember, the Rambam is living at a time where people have all kinds of doubts. There's a lot of philosophers, especially the Greeks, all saying their own ideas, but ideas that are not founded in the Torah. So they're not divine, they're human, they're man-made. So the Rambam has to make it clear what does the Torah have to say about free will. 
And he says, listen, don't think like the groups of people who say that everything is predetermined from above, you have no free will, no choice. There were two camps, as I said before, two very opposing camps. One camp that held everything is predetermined, you have no choice. You basically are just an actor. And there were others said, Mapito, <laughs> what do you mean? Actors, we have complete free will, but we know that that's not true either. We don't have complete free will over everything in life. We don't determine. We can't decide everything. Imagine somebody who's going to court, he's being accused of something. Does he have free will of the outcome of what's going to happen in court? Of course not. Not everything is up to us. So the philosophers, a lot of them, argued all kinds of theories. Yes, free will, no free will, how much predetermination, is there any predetermination or predestination? Is, is that exit? Is that, they argued. They don't have a tradition. They have to figure this out on their own. And they couldn't. They were stuck. The reason why they were stuck is because the two are not compatible. If you hold predestination that everything is predetermined from before, then you're saying basically there's no free will. If you're saying there's free will, then you're saying, well, there's no predestination. I mean, the, the two are not really compatible. Even though some tried to reconcile the two, they didn't succeed. So soon I'm going to tell you what the Torah says. What, how does the Torah reconcile the two? Because the, true, the two camps, or the two ideas, I should say, are true. There is something that is predestined, and there is nevertheless free will. But you can understand how meshugane they were, <laughs> how they were crazy. They, they, they didn't know how, how to deal with this. Is it this or that, or a little bit of both? So the Rambam says, no, let me make it very clear that permission is given, I'm, I'm translating it into English, permission is given to every human being. In other words, he can incline himself to go to the good side and to be a righteous man. It's, it's within his ability. If he wants to la tota smule derech ra'a, liot rasha, and to be a wicked man, evil, a rashut biyado, he has the ability to be a rasha too. En ha kadosh b'ruchu gozer ala adam mitchilat b'riyato l'idiot tzadik rasha. Don't ever think that Hashem decrees when a person is born, you're going to be a tzadik or you're going to be a rasha. It doesn't make sense. So don't even think like that. And this is an important principle, it says in Judaism, that we as human beings are the ones that make the determination whether we will be good or bad. And Hashem does not pull him in any direction, does not decree upon him on how, what he should be. The Maharal Prague also says something similar, that Hashem created us in the image of God, the image of God meaning that He gave us something that He has, not that He has an image. Image of it here does not mean and he has an image because he has no image or form. But it, what is Betzalmenu Kitmuteno? Something that he has. What is that? He gave us the ability to be somewhat independent. He gave us the ability to think. To think. What does thinking come from? Even though animals think, that it's, it's pretty much pre, it's pre-programmed what they think. They're basically interested in survival. They need to eat, right? They need to take care of their, of their young. Isn't that what all animals have in common? They run from danger. The basic instincts of survival. So man was given the tools for survival too. It's not just that he needs to eat and procreate and all these things, but there's something else he has, and he has the ability to think, the ability to choose between right and wrong. As the morale continues to say, this is something that Hashem has, of course. I mean, He has that ability to be by Himself independent. And He has given us something that resembles Him. Adam, yes, reshub yadol asot mashi yitzeh ubal bechira. He can pretty much do not every time and not everything, but He can do certain things on His own. He can make the decisions. And Tehillim, pretty much in the very, very beginning, David Melech makes it very clear. David Amalek says very clearly, fortunate is a person who would not throughout his life follow in the advice of the evil, the wicked, or the sinners, and does not assemble, or does not uh, associate with the mockers, with the people who are not serious. In other words, fortunate 
is that individual who is able to make the right choices in life and knows with who to stick around, what to do, and what not to do. So again, we see from many, many verses, our tradition is very clear. We have a high degree of free will. And I'll explain why, why, what I mean by a high degree, because it's limited, even though we do have a high, uh, high degree of free will. There is something also called mazal, which many of you already are familiar from the various lectures. Mazal is a system that Hashem put into place that guides us through our life. It guides us in many, many ways. This mazal, believe it or not, is the one that actually chooses for you what you're going to be. There is a mazal that chooses for one individual to be a plumber, for another one to be a doctor, for another one to be a lawyer, for another one to be uh, not a gambler, because that's not a mazal. (laughs) (laughs) That's something (laughs) he chose on his own. That shouldn't be a profession, (laughs) but it is for some. All the careers you can think of. Not everybody wants to be the same thing. Baruch Hashem. Can you imagine everybody wanting to be a lawyer? (laughs) Oh, it would be terrible. (laughs) Lawyers. (laughs) Anyway, so the mazal places, places us in a certain derech, in a certain path where we are led to become certain things, it pretty much determines how long you will live, even though that's a little bit based on genes too. It determines who you will marry, how many kids you will have, how much money you will make, uh, where you will live. This is approximately what the mazal does. It's a system that Hashem put into place that manages the world. There's a certain degree of order there's, there has to be some management and some balance because if human beings would decide everything, things wouldn't work out. Look, look at the world the way it is today. You know, it's a mess in many, many ways. But certain things Hashem leaves to Himself. So mazal, for reasons that we will discuss in a couple of weeks, by the way, in, in the three weeks, we will be discussing a topic called reincarnation. Fascinating topic. Let everybody know. It's a very incredible concept, and uh, I hope to show you a video of uh, a child who knows what he was in the previous reincarnation. Very fascinating story, and he's not Jewish, he's a Druze in Israel. And, but there are many, many stories of reincarnation, but that, well, of that I have a video. So when you understand Mazal, it will help you understand also reincarnation. Yes. Um, yes, but can't we also alter mazal, like with Yom Kippur and stuff, can't our uh, actions, if we behave good in life, um, affect um, and change our yeah, that's, fortune? that's a good question. That's a valid question. Can we change the mazal that is predestined? Am Yisrael is above the mazal, the rabbis tell us. Above the mazal means that you still have it, but you can change it with the Shuvat Tefilan Tzedakah, repentance through prayer, through charity, sometimes that is. When Hashem deems it right, that the moment is propitious, there can be an alteration to the mazal. If the mazal has any bad decree from a previous reincarnation, like there will be no children, chaz v'shalom, Hashem can change that. Well, you will have, but it happens after 17 years. Haven't you heard of couples that after 17 years or more, all of a sudden they gave birth? And sometimes it happened after they adopted one. <laughs> You know, Dafka after they adopted a child, that's when they had their own. It could be through that mitzvah, they changed their mazal. So you're right. It is difficult to change. Difficult because Hashem usually wants this mazal for some reason for the individual. This is his tikkun, this is the type of life that he will have. Nevertheless, it can be changed, you're right. So even though we find that the goyim, have difficulties reconciling mazal and free will. Here we're saying we believe in predestination, which is what mazal is, right? Something that's predestined or predetermined from before, what's going to be? And here we're saying there's free will. That means that we're making the choices and the decisions. Great. But they're not compatible, we said. Comes along Judaism and says they are compatible. You know why? Because I'm going to tell you where there is predestination and where there isn't. 
where there is free will and where there isn't. Hakol bidei shamayim, chutz mirat shamayim. With that statement, the rabbis clarified the entire subject, the entire conflict that the goyim have. You want to know what's predestined? Just about everything. <laughs> you, don't want, you want to know what not? What do we have free will then? Yirat Shamayim. What does Yirat Shamayim mean? The words mean the fear of heaven. But what it really encompasses is the fulfillment of mitzvot, whether we're going to be good or bad. In other words, anything that has to do with how much money you're going to make, you have no decision to. You have no decision. I mean, you can't sit back at home and do nothing. <laughs> but if you go out and try your best, you, drew, you dress up beautifully, you prepare your resume, and you're working hard on getting this job, and the guy says, I'm sorry, you know, you're not hired. What, what are you going to You're going to blame yourself? No, you did everything you can. That was not your mazal. You very much like a girl, or for the girls, you very much like a boy. And it just doesn't work out. And you did nothing wrong. You weren't picky and you weren't going to demand $100,000 for, for dowry. You know, you didn't do anything wrong. <coughs> it wasn't meant for you. That's not your soulmate. What do you want? So don't harp on it. Don't cry over it. Let go. It's not meant for you. Hashem knows what's meant for you. What job is meant for you? What house is meant for you? Oh, I wish I could have bought the house. It wasn't meant for you. If it was meant for you, you would have had it. See, a lot of people don't have this level of bitachon, of trust and faith in God, that whatever is meant for you, you're going to have it. Whatever is not meant for you, no matter how hard you try, you're not going to get it. So where is their free will? Yirat Shemaim. But in order for people to understand really what Yirat Shemaim means, I have to give examples. Divorce is not predestined. Usually not. There are a few exceptions. Men and women make the decision. They don't want to get along. I said they don't want to, not that they, they don't. They don't want to. Because if they really wanted to, they could. They've chosen not to get along. They've chosen to part their ways. That's their decision. Now, whether you like chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream, that's also a little bit your decision, but that has to do with a preference in your body. There's a one small, small area, in addition to, to Yerat Shemayim, that is within our uh, decision making. Rabbi tells us that everything is in the hands of heaven except for catching colds and flus. Tzinim means colds. You, you go outside, you don't dress right. Guess what? You may catch a cold. <coughs> and pahim is also like fevers, flus, stomach aches. If you eat rotten food, well, what do you expect? You know, you're going to get a stomach ache. That's all. So that's up to you to be careful. Now, let's say you didn't know. Let's say you didn't know. Let's say you were invited somewhere and you ate something bad. Then that could be the national mind. Because it wasn't your fault at all, completely. You know, you, just, you, know, you trip, like tripping somewhere. Like, do, you know, you didn't see it. It's not like you should have seen it. You know, so some things are bidei shamayim. Some things you should have known better. So, but generally speaking, generally speaking, in order for us to understand this very, very clear, just about everything is Vedesha mind that has to do with our life as far as where we're going to be, what we're going to end up doing, who we're going to marry, things like that. But the details that concern our actions, whether they're good or bad, whether we're nice or not nice, stingy, selfish, get angry, that's up to us. Another word for calling it, instead of Yirat mind is Midot. How do you behave? Will you learn Torah? Will you fulfill mitzvot? If you're a man, will you put on tefillin every day? Will you put on mezuzah on your door? <coughs> will you eat kosher? If you're a woman, will you keep family purity? Will you keep Shabbat? That's up to you. Otherwise, why are we being judged? In other words, wherever we are being judged, that is where we have free will. Hashem says, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to hold you, going to hold you accountable. Is Hashem going to hold us accountable for how much money we made? Believe me, he will not. <laughs> He's not going to tell you, Shimon, you could have made a million dollars, you know? Ah, they, don't, they don't care. He, he, he was content with the little bit that he made. You know, they're not going to be upset at him, you could have made more. If they wanted to give him more, they would have given him an inheritance, you know, or something. 
So that, that, that does not upset Shemayim. What upsets Shemayim is you have so much potential. You can do so much more. You've get, you, 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 you have $500 million. You can give more charity. You can do so many things with that money. What are you sitting around doing nothing? Or why are you spending it for the, in the wrong area? That's Yirat Shemayim too. You've been, you, you, we gave you a sweet voice. Why don't you use it for Hazanu, to be a Hazan, to read from the Torah? We gave you this and this talent. Why don't you use it for some good use? That's also part of Yirat Shemayim. So you, you get the feeling of what Yirat Shemayim means. Yirat Shemayim means an area where we actually make a decision on how we use that which Hashem has given us. What He has given us, He decided. That's predestined. How we use it, for what we use it, how we behave, what kind of people, human beings we become, that's up to us. So the Goyim have no clue. The Goyim really have trouble understanding the difference. We make it simple. The area where you have free will is the area of Rat Shemaim. Sadiq or Rasha, evil or righteous, good or bad. You could be a good husband, a good friend. Are you going to misbehave? That's up to you. Everything else is not up to you. So everyone has his own mazal, depending on what Hashem has decided for his destiny. But ultimately, what he makes of himself in that mazal, within that framework, let's call it framework, that will be up to him. How is he supposed to know what to do, or how to do, or how to go about it? For that, he has a map. What's the road map? The Torah. The Torah is a road map on how to behave, what to do, and what not to do. Very simple. But wait a minute. Is that enough? No, it's not enough. You also need a helper. Who's going to help you? Your wife. Your spouse. <coughs> that is why it's important to get married. Not just to have kids. Not just to have kids. Having kids is a mitzvah. That's part of marriage. One of the main ideas behind marriage, however, is help. Not helping in cooking and doing your laundry. That's not the kind of help I meant. Help means what the Torah says, adam levado. It's not a good idea for man to be on his own. He just won't make it. If you're single, then you're half your potential. Only when you get married will she really take all your juice out. <laughs> but I meant it in a positive way. <laughs> you know, don't misunderstand. She's going to take your juice, all your juice out. She's going to take out. She has the ability to draw your potential, to make you what you can be. And you her too, right? So as that can do, Hashem says, I'm making a woman to help the man. I'm making a man to help the woman. They both need each other. I'm not going to give a man all the responsibilities. Could you imagine if a man had to also cook, do the laundry, change diapers, give birth, you know, everything, and work for a living? It's impossible, <coughs> right? And imagine if he had all the feelings a woman has, all the emotions and sensitivities. He'd be crazy. He'd be confused. <laughs> He'd be very moody. One day like this, one day like that. So all the feelings and moods go to the woman. <laughs> what? And sometimes, by the way, they change roles somehow. You know, the man behaves like the woman, and the woman behaves like the man. It's okay as long as they get along. It's, it's not a problem. Some men know how to cook very well. They take over the kitchen. And the women don't mind. And some women... Yell at the husband, you better not step into the kitchen. This is my room. You know, I'm in charge. All right. Whatever works for you. <laughs> it's okay. There's all kinds. But they need each other. They complement each other. They're supposed to complement each other. If the two have met and they really are for each other, they're really Zivug and Hashemayim, of course. That's the whole idea. So you have the Torah, that's the map. You have this, the helper, that's the spouse. What else do you need? You have a map, that's direction. You have help, that's the one. What else do we need? We need the drive and the motivation to want to do it. Where does that come from? Where does the drive and motivation to do it come from? The interest. Now, some people have the help. They have the map. They're geniuses. They know it all by heart, too. But they lack drive, incentive, motivation. That comes from the neshama, you should know. The neshama... Usually, if you listen to it, if you pay attention to it, it's talking to us all the time. Do it. Time is running out. You're 66 already, not you. you know, imagine. <laughs> what have you done? 66. No, 66 is getting there. 
you know. 66. 85% of your life is gone, approximately. What a no, that's what the Neshama tells the person, but he's asleep. He doesn't think about it. He's thinking about remodeling his kitchen, perhaps, going on vacation to Hawaii, or perhaps, uh, I don't know, taking his grandson on, on, a, on a fishing tour. I mean, people think of all kinds of things. What about yourself? Have you thought about yourself? What have you done? What have you accomplished in life? The Neshama talks like that. That's the language of the Neshama. Because the neshama is not physical. The neshama is spiritual. The physical body thinks of its needs. The spiritual part of us, the neshama, thinks of what Hashem wants. It knows clearly what Hashem wants. It's not confused at all. So the sechel, the common sense, is hopefully going to be driven and motivated by the neshama to do the right thing. And, and, and to go about doing it. Why doesn't it happen? Why doesn't it happen? We all have Baruch Hashem Sechel. A little bit more. Right? We all have it. We all have a Neshama. So what's going on? People are not listening. They, they do listen. The problem is, that's where all the problems begin. We have this, this Siyuwa, we have the help. Hashem gave us a spouse. We have the Torah, we have a map. We have the Sechel, which is supposed to drive us and motivate us to do the right thing, and the, and the good thing, the positive thing. Something goes wrong. What goes wrong? Anybody want to guess what goes wrong? Where is the problem then? We have everything that Hashem has given us to do the job right, to succeed in life. We all have a mission, we all have a unique mission. We're given the tools for our survival. We have, of course, the ability to choose, but not everybody chooses to do the right thing. What is it? Yetzara. Yetzara. But Yetzara is too simple of a word. What is the Yetzara? The evil inclination. The evil inclination. But what is that? So when we spoke about the Neshama, how the Neshama is divine, what, what, what did we really say? We basically said that man is different than an animal in this very important area, that he has something an animal does not have. And that is something divine from above, something that is spiritual. Whereas an animal is all physical. The problem is man is, a, is an animal too. He's not only spiritual, otherwise he'd be an angel. So we have a, a little bit of both. We have half-half. Part of us is angel, part of us is divine, is a spiritual, the neshama, and part of us is physical. And guess what? The two don't mix, it's like oil and water. And they fight. They don't want the same things. This one speaks Persian, this one speaks Spanish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah, completely different. Everything is different. Right? So what are you going to do? That is the battle of the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah told. The famous, famous battle that everybody has, man, woman, Jew or non-Jew, young or old. Yes, even the old people. We all have a Yetzirah. The question is how you deal with it. For those of you who had a chance to read the story of Adam Rishon and Chava and the serpent, it's not a fairy tale. A serpent uh, seducing or inciting Chava to eat from the forbidden tree and the fruit. What's going on over there? In the beginning of creation of the world, we have a story about a serpent talking to Adam and Chava, and they go against Hashem's wishes. What's going on? The basic understanding of that story is symbolic of the continuous battle that mankind will have with the Yetzirah, which is the serpent. Remember, Hashem is telling us through this story, I've created you, I've given you great abilities. You know who's going to be in your way to stop you? And I created him too. He's called the Nahash. He's called the Yetzirah. And he has another job too after he's done with you. He's called the Malach HaMavet too. And after the Malach HaMavet takes your soul, he has a third job called Satan. That he will accuse you upstairs for listening to him. <laughs> Understand? He has all these roles. Hashem created, but he has to, Hashem has to be fair. He has to allow for free will. He can't make it too easy and too obvious. Otherwise, what's the whole idea? It's, what kind of a game is this? So he doesn't make it too obvious. He doesn't make it too easy. But he gives us the abilities to win. 
So let, let me give you a few examples of what happens in that story of Chet Adam Arishon. We have free will, right? Where do we see that? From the Pasuk, Batocha mina etza shetziviticha lemor lo tochal mimeno. Hashem tells Adam, look at yourself. You just went against me. You went against me. You've eaten from the tree that I told you, that I commanded you not to eat. What's this for? What's this conversation all about? You've done something that is opposed to my wishes. In other words, you have that ability. Man can oppose or can go against Hashem's wishes. Man has free will. So that is clear, a clear indicator that we have free will. What happens after that? What does man do to avoid free will? Look at the next pasuk. What does, how does Adam contend with this mistake that he made? It was wife's fault. Yes. They always, always blame the women, right? It's the wife. It's the woman you gave me. She made me do it. What's that all about? Can anybody explain in a couple words what that's, what that's all about? You don't have to be a psychologist for this. What is, what is Adam doing? Okay, you can call him ungrateful also. Escape what else? Escape responsibility. Yes, very simple. You can say, there's a lot of things you can say about it, but the simple explanation is he's running away from his responsibilities. Just say, yes, I'm sorry. So Hashem is revealing to us through this story that man's justification for doing the wrong thing, instead of fixing it, is to run away from it. And if what's interesting, I, I was thinking about it today, in Hebrew, if you know Hebrew just a little bit, look at the word for free will. It's called Bechira. Bet Het Okay? Bechira. What's the Hebrew word for escape? Beriha. The exact same letters, just switch the head and the, red, and the resh around. Bechira versus Beriha. Do you want to choose, decide? Then confess and fix, correct? Not beriha. <coughs> beriha means I don't want to decide, I don't want to think about it, I don't want to deal with it. That's what human beings do. And the ultimate example later on of how these sins of turning away from Hashem lead to, Vayakum Kain el Hevel Achi Vayargeo. Kain gets up and kills his brother Hevel. And it was moving away from God, you eventually end up doing all the wrong things. You run away from responsibilities, you think only of yourself, that's what happens. But there's one more idea in that story, at least one more idea. Hashem tells Kain, Elohim tetiv se'et, im lo tetiv la petach atat rovetz, velecha teshukato vatatim shol bo. Very powerful, long statement, of important piece of advice. He says basically, Kain, if you do Teshuvah, if you change your ways, you become better, I will forgive you. If you don't change your ways, just remember, La Peta Hatat Rovetz, the Yetzirah is always there. Your sin will always be there. You, you, you will always be, you, if you don't change your ways, you will always fall again. You can't fall again. Because Elecha Teshukato, you're always dependent on the Yetzirah. Elecha Teshukato means he looks for ways to bring you down. You like it, you have ta'avot, desires. But here comes the key words at the end, vatatim shol bo, but you have the ability to control him. People say, I was born like this. Even homosexuals, they were born like that, there's no such thing. And even if you have an inclination towards that, let's say there's an inclination, inclinations exist. But atatim shol bo, you're able to control it you're able to get over it. You're strong. You have free will. So even if you've gone away, even if you strayed, whether it's from the very early part of your life or later on, you can change your ways. You can't change your nature. It doesn't say that anywhere. But you can control it. Controlling is not changing. It just means that you have to hold on tight and not allow your yet, sir, to control you. You can control it. Don't let him control you. So these are just some ideas that I learned from that one story, one incident in Pereshit involving the serpent. You have free will, you can make decisions, 
Just be responsible, make the right decision, and if you made the wrong decision, do Teshuvah, fix it. Fix what you've done wrong. So what we see from this so far is that it's true that even though we all have a Yetzirah, and because of the Yetzirah we have certain inclinations, and those inclinations come about because of our physical desires. Physical desires, and people have different physical desires. Some people are temperamental. Some people are lazy, right? Some people are stingy. And then there's some that have all of the above. Hashem <laughs> you know, you know. That's terrible. They have more than one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, boy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But we have the ability to control it and to overcome it. <coughs> what does it depend on? It depends on what we want. What do you want? Do you want to control it or not? How many people do you know that had a problem with uh, smoking and they dropped it? Don't you know somebody? He was smoking, he dropped the habit. It was hard, nobody said it's not, that it's easy. But he, he did it, completely. Now, some people, of course, will fall back. But there are real examples in life where people had a bad habit, very, very bad habit, that it was very hard to give up, but they gave it up. What does that show? It shows what they say in Hebrew, en davar omed There's nothing that stands in the way of a strong will. If you have a strong will, and it comes to nature, character, then you can overcome almost anything. I'm talking about something ruhani. There are certain things that no matter how much you can want them, you're not going to get them. But when it comes to working on yourself, to become a better person, to drop a bad habit, it's possible. Yes? Didn't Hashem, though, create some of us with a stronger personality, with a stronger capacity, and some of us with a weaker um, personality and capacity? Okay, that's a good question. Did Hashem create some of us with more of a capacity than the others? The answer is yes and no. What does that mean? In other words, it's, it's, it wouldn't be fair for some to have more of a capacity than others. You know what I mean? So he's going to be able to do it, and he will not be able to do it? Do you see what I mean? I see that all the time, though. No, no, no. How, what, what Hashem does do, however, is that no two people have the same challenge. As the rabbis tell us, Ena kadosh baruchu ba bitrunya in biryotav. Hashem will never demand of you more than your capacity. And there's a saying in... Uh, in Farsi and in Arabic, I think, that Hashem does not burden the camel, something like that, with more than what he could take. I forget exactly how it goes. Some saying like that, that Hashem will not give you a burden more than what you can handle. There are challenges in life. You know that Chaz Shalom, to raise a child that is a very difficult child, whether it's, he's difficult because of health reasons, whether he's difficult for behavioral reasons, is a big challenge. Not every couple will have that challenge because not every couple can handle that chi- kind of a child. And I know, I, I'm sure you know what I mean, right? There's all kinds of challenges. What if somebody, I don't, I don't want to even give examples. Terrible, all kinds of terrible tragedies, challenges, difficulties in life. Not everybody will have them. Hashem knows who to give them to. And whoever gets them, Hashem has equipped him with the tools to be able to handle it. So if you are going through a difficult challenge, guess what? Hashem gave you the tools, equipped you with the tools to be able to survive it, to be able to deal with it. He would not give it to that individual because he can't. So you're right. Some people cannot handle the same challenge, but they can handle whatever challenge Hashem gave them. Yeah, but sometimes you try to fight that challenge and you fail. Of course, the Yetzirah, going back to the Yetzirah. You only fail because of the Yetzirah. No, but I mean, uh, you know, don't you mean you can eventually get it because you fail, uh, sometimes you fail a few times before you succeed. Yes, that could happen always because in the very be- in the very beginning, you know, you may not know what you're doing. You may easily give up if you see it's hard. But after a while, if you're more and more motivated, you will see that it's not so difficult after all. But in the beginning, you may need some convincing, you may need some outside encouragement, you, you may not believe in yourself, you may not be so self-confident. That's why you, it's good to get married, so your wife will push you a little bit too. <laughs> yeah, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Come on, I know you can. Right? That's, that comes from the woman usually. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi, you also mentioned that sometimes 
So what will happen is like, the spark will put in the shama that is very large in, in a certain individual. Sometimes yeah. what will happen is they'll put a female in the shama in a male's body or a male the shama in a female's body. It will happen oftentimes. Okay. So you can say that the inclination is not always what it's supposed to be. Sometimes it, it varies. No, I said inclinations uh, uh, are there for a variety of reasons. We never... You know, we're, we'll discuss it right now, why these inclinations exist to begin with. Uh, it may have something to do with the topic of reincarnation. Uh, it does have a little bit to do with one's mazal, because there are some mazal that are more feminine. Okay? Just the nature of that mazal is a little bit more feminine. There's some, nature, there's some mazal that are a little bit more masculine. The, the energy, some energies are negative and some are positive. So depending on how much positive or how much negative there could be, there are some people that have so much, neg- so much certain kinds of energy, I call it Martian energy, that the Gemara says they want to be a murderer. They want to kill. It's in them. Right? So what does the Gemara suggest? Use that energy to become a shohet, slaughter an animal instead of a man. You know what I mean? <laughs> Redirect that energy to be a mohel or a shohet. So you can have certain inclinations, but then you have to know how to redirect it properly. Mm-hmm. That takes us back to what we said before. That is why we have a Torah. The Torah tells us what to do. The Torah tells these people what to do as well. What do you do with this kind of an inclination? One of the things the Torah says, by the way, when a person goes with the, uh, with the wrong mate, the Torah says to'eva. To'eva means an abomination, but the rabbis learn from this word Toeba, he's making a mistake. And it was part of the problem is psychological. The Torah is telling us. It's part of the reason that he has this inclination is psychological. It's mental. It's not something a physical drive that is 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 he's being attracted to the wrong thing. Nothing to do with that. It's psychological. Toeba, you're making a mistake. How? Mental. You're wrong. There's a problem in your way of thinking. Now, why is there a problem in your way of thinking? That, of course, has to do with one's mazal, one's tikkun, or one's circumstances. There are people who have become like that because of circumstances. Okay? An abusive father, as psychologists say, or in jail, amongst men. All kinds of things that can bring this out because every human being has the ability to divert, to divert in the wrong direction. Every human being, even those who are normal, those who are normal, listen to this, even those who are normal have the ability within their system to divert all of a sudden in the wrong direction. If they're tempted enough, or the circumstances, or something happens. Many times these things happen to them early on, many things, some other times it happens later on in life. But regardless, the mazal, I do agree that many times the mazal has a little bit to do with it, but that only to the extent of giving a certain inclination. It you know, leans this way, just like a person may be inclined to be stingy, a person may be inclined to be more temperamental, a little bit more lazy, right? Or uh, very critical. There are inclinations. This is what we call character. We spoke about this in astrology. Okay? But... Let's not forget the more important idea that regardless, regardless, you still have the free will and the ability to conquer it, to control it, and to get over it. Get over it means not necessarily to eradicate it from the system, but to be able to deal with it successfully, that it wouldn't bother you anymore. However, those who do not learn Torah, those who are not aware of the ultimate taqlid, what am I doing in this world? What is life all about? They're going to have the most difficult time. If somebody knows that there is a creator in the world, if somebody is convinced that he's accountable for his actions, if one knows for certain that his actions are meaningful and they make a difference, he has a reason to be careful and to do teshuvah, to repent, to change his ways. He, he has reason to do so. If somebody does not believe in this, if somebody doesn't think there's a creator, if somebody doesn't believe that there is a, uh, that there is a harb, honor, reward, and punishment, if somebody does not believe in the Torah, he doesn't think that life has a tachlit, a purpose, 
Now, why should he? Why should he change? Why should he become a better person? Why should he drop this habit? He might think it's natural. It's normal to be like that. What's the incentive? Well, right. It's just like the example with abortions. If a woman is not religious and she doesn't believe in a god, she feels this is a piece of flesh. It's part of me. I can decide what I want to do with it. Not, not so if somebody believes that every human life has value, that there is a God that brought us into this life. You see how one's thinking will determine one's actions. And if a person's way of thinking is healthy, it's based on certain values, then his, actual, his actions will, be, will correspond. In other words, will be based on those values that he has. So that's what's going to make a big difference in one's life, is what are your values? what's important to you, what are your priorities, what are your beliefs, that will determine the actions. But actions, of course we're capable of taking, of carrying them out, certain actions. But will we or will we not will depend on if we value it. If somebody values marriage, he's going to get married. If he values the marriage very, very much, then he'll do everything in his power not to divorce. If he loves his kids, He's going to hang on to the marriage regardless of the difficulties, most of the time, right? Depending on what the problems are. It all depends. But what, what really happens is most people do not value their kids more than themselves. They're selfish. I can't take it. Yeah, but you're hurting the kids if you break up. Now, sometimes, by the way, the divorce is healthy and necessary because staying with the marriage is worse for the kids. There are exceptions. There are times that we, we you can't just you can't have a husband and fight a husband and wife fighting every day and the kids are witnessing it, right? Obviously that's not good. But I'm talking about in the normal situations, husbands and wives who really care about the health of their kids, growing up normal, they really should stick it out. That's what's best for the kids too. So it all depends on your values. So one more time, without clear understanding of what life is all about, without a clear understanding of what we're here for, what, our, what is our mission, then we're not going to be as motivated to do certain things. You know what some people do when they give, when they, things are just too hard for them? They give up? No, no, give up is easy. They commit suicide. Why? Why do they commit suicide, Hazrat Shalom? Yes? It's because uh, I know this uh, almost firsthand. It's because life is so, they don't necessarily believe in God. They don't right. have any purpose to live. Exactly. You know, they That's don't know correct. the Torah. What, what purpose right. is there? To exactly. Then the, the why, st the why, the why struggle? Why life, continue to suffer? Life is all suffering, all pain. What's the point of it? What's continuing? the point of it? Right. So depending on what the values are of this individual, what, you know, people, depending on their, on their situation, need guidance. People always need guidance. The best of people need guidance. You cannot always make decisions on your own. You need to consult with someone, either with a rabbi or with your wife. You, know, you cannot always make the right decision on your own. You know, we, we sometimes have really a difficult time deciding. So, and we can't always trust our judgment because we may be biased also. Right? When an individual runs away from his problems by committing suicide, He's done a tremendous folly. What's the folly here? What's the crazy thing here? He didn't consult with somebody. He didn't talk about his problems, about the issues. It's very possible that had he spoken up, that had he shared his feelings and his predicament with somebody who, of course, is knowledgeable, he could have easily, easily got him out of it. On your own, it's sometimes very difficult. You go crazy. But remember what we said before in answer to your question. Hashem never puts you in a situation which is too difficult for you to handle. But what, what is the problem? Hashem is not in your life. If Hashem is not in your life, then you, don't, then you don't know these things. If you knew Him, if you understood that, then you would say to myself, wait a minute, I was told that regardless of the difficulty that I am in, that I'm in Hashem has equipped me with the ways to deal with it. I, if I don't know, I'm going to find out. But I know I, I can do it. If I can do it, then what's the problem? Yes? Sometimes there's no one for that person to talk to. Sometimes they're in a situation, their family's not religious, they, uh, 
They don't know, they've turned to every psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, and nothing works. Um, you know what they, they don't need? know to turn to a rabbi. You know what they need to do then? Become through. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's what helped me. No, 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 no. no. I mean, from religious is obvious is, is, a, is too too easy of an answer. The best thing you can tell a person who's not so from yet, I say yet because hopefully he will be more observant, is pray. Because one of the easiest things to do for one who's just a little bit of a believer, but he's not observant, but at least he's a believer, that means he has hope because there's a God, and when there's a God. Maybe this God listens too. See, that's where Druidism is very, very different than many of the old philosophies and, and civilizations. Is that God did not only create the world; He's involved. He listens to us. He, he hears our prayers, and prayer is powerful. He, that's a connection with Him. That's the easiest thing you can tell somebody, even who's not religious. You know what? Do you believe in God? Do you know that you can pray to Him? Uh, a lot of the time, at that point, they've given up any belief All right. in God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's what we've been saying till now that somebody who does not have this belief, not only is he lacking the strength and the motivation, he's really going to be in a predicament. He won't know what to do. He won't see reason to, to, to live on his life. You're right. That's why it's so dangerous not to be connected in some way to a, a, a system of values and beliefs, to, to a sham, because other, you sometimes need to turn to him. You know, There was a story recently I, I heard of someone who a couple years ago became religious, he was totally secular. He went for a dive and he ran out of oxygen and he was, within a few seconds he was going to die. This is completely irreligious, secular, completely Israeli. And all of a sudden the only thing he could think of is Ribbono Shalom. He said Almighty, you know. That was the only words he said. He didn't say, help me, I pray to you, I become from religious. He didn't say that. He doesn't even know what that is. He just, he just knew that there was something like that. As soon as he said those words, somehow, he doesn't know how, the waves opened up and he saw the land and just went over. He doesn't know. He says it was a miracle. So there are many, many such stories. Just a little word or two, right? Turn to him and he will show you the way. But that's, what, that's the point I'm making, that if you don't have that, then of course life is going to be much more difficult. What do you do? There's no money. You were just fired. What do you do? If you don't have a strong emunah and bitachon and you don't have that connection, you, you may go crazy. You can become nervous. You're going to break. The hope can fall apart because of that. When one, one of the two does not have uh, a livelihood, it can really make things very, very tense in the house, stressful. The more one is connected to Hashem, the more one has bitachon in Hashem, the more one realizes that everything is guided from above, the easier it is for him to deal with the challenge. Now, besides knowledge, besides being aware of certain things, we do have something called conscience. As in Hebrew, it's called matzpun. Matzpun is also an important idea to keep in mind. Sometimes we don't know if to do something. Our matzpun tells us, our conscience tells us if something is right or wrong. We still need the Torah because there are many, many areas that we would not know what to do, what is right and what is wrong. But many, many times there is a matzpun. The neshama on its own knows what to do, what is right and what is wrong. Even without the Torah, as the rabbis tells in the Gemara, had the Jewish people not received the Torah, we would have learned certain things from animals. For example, you would have learned loyalty from doves. You would have learned modesty from cats. You would have learned diligence from ants. <laughs> we would have learned things. The problem is people don't want to learn. But if you listen to your conscience, if you look around creation, there's a lot of things that you can pick up. The problem is people don't listen to them. So now that we understand the strength of free will, the importance of free will, what it entails, it entails responsibilities, let's take a look, a real quick look at the difference between evolution and Judaism. As an example, evolution claims we come from nothing. Big Bang, in stages, over millions of years, right? What is it, how does evolution look at the human being? You're an accident. <laughs> yeah, you're basically an accident, a freak accident. Because statistically, you don't make sense. Life has no purpose. 
And therefore, you're here, enjoy it. <laughs> that's all. That's, that's what life is all about in the eyes of evolution. What does Judaism say? You are the crown of creation. You're the most important. Creation was for you. Right? You are a partner in creation. And life is so important and so meaningful. Make the most of it in a spiritual way, of course. Look at the difference. Wow. Two different kinds of lives. Two different kinds of values. All right. Another difference between evolution and Judaism. According to evolution, who is strong? If you have mil muscles and you can raise 500 pounds and get the gold medal in the Olympics, that's, that's somebody who's strong. What does Judaism say? Ezel Gibor? Who is strong? One who controls his desires, one who controls his tempers, one who is basically is in control of himself. That's something to admire. Not if you were born with something, which is God-given, a gift. Not if you have something, a talent that you, that you have from birth. Something that you developed on your own, like, con like conquering your, your spirit, your yetzer. Ezu Ashir, what's the difference between evolutions Understanding of who's rich. According to evolution, you're rich if you have a billion dollars after taxes. <laughs> right? A billion dollars, that makes you rich. And what's rich according to Jewish standards? Ezu Ashir, Samer Bechelko, whoever's content with what he has. Different way of looking at life, different value system, different philosophies. That is why in the creation of man, you will not see the words Kitov. Shem looks at everything that he's made, everything is good. Except for man. Man, we just said he's the crown of creation. Why doesn't he say that man is good? Because man will decide on his own whether he will be good. And when will, he, when will we know if he actually became good? When we accompany him to his resting place and we eulogize him, we can say, yeah, he was a good man, he was a good husband, he was a good father, he was a good friend and an uncle and so forth. But when he's born, all babies are cute. Did you ever see a baby that was not cute? I mean, they're all cute. <laughs> You know, they're all arguing, oh, he looks like the mother, he looks like the father, but they're all cute. But that ba cute baby can one day become a monster, did you know that? Hitler. Did you know Hitler was going to be Hitler when he was a cute little baby? And he was, I'm sure, cute too. How could you tell? Babies from the baby, you don't know if he's going to be good or bad. Only life will tell, because it depends on what he will make of himself. So Hashem says, I'm going to leave Kitov for you to decide whether you'll be a Tov or you'll not be Tov. All right, what do we have left? We have the itmodedut, as we call it in Hebrew. Itmodedut means ultimately the greatest task that a human being has, not Jew or non-Jew, is the itmodedut, the challenge, the task of dealing with this yetzerah that we've been talking about so much tonight. What's the best and most effective way of dealing with him? You see, he's the source of all trouble. He's the one that's making us misuse our free will. Then what is the secret of of our hitmonidut with him, of our dealings with him. How do we deal with him effectively? What's the answer? Study the Torah. Yes. The rabbis tell us, study Torah. Why? Because Hashem says, I created the Yetzirah for good reason. And we already discussed the reasons for that. <coughs> but I also created the Torah as a tavlin, an antidote. Don't think you're going to have it hard. It's not easy, but it's not going to be too hard either. Because if you learn the Torah, you will cool him off. You will distract him, and you will be victorious in the end. Without the, without the Torah, you're going to have a difficult time. Now, I know some people are thinking the following. I know individuals <coughs> who are so kind-hearted, they're such a gentleman, they have no Torah. What do you say to that? Do you know that the Nazis used to go to operas, and they were intellectuals, and they, they behaved very nicely when they meet each other. They said, Danke schön. Very civilized people. But do, they, do you know what they did to your relatives? What these same civilized people, good nature supposedly, right? Enjoyed classical opera, what they did when they chose to do during the Holocaust? How could it be? Anytime there's no Torah, there's no guarantee what this individual will do tomorrow. Because the rabbis tell us, Im en Torah en derecheretz. 
If there's no Torah, then there's no Derech Eretz, which means good character? Yes, there may be there, but it's not a guaranteed Derech Eretz. Imen Derech Eretz and Torah, I know. If a person doesn't have Derech Eretz, then the Torah that he learns is, now, is worthless. What good is it if a person doesn't behave himself, doesn't, he's not, doesn't display good character if he learns Torah? But I ne- it's hard to understand that the other way around. If a person has no Torah, then he has no Derech Eretz. I know a lot of Goyim, non-Jews, who have no Torah. And they're so nice. Yes, by nature people are nice too. They have good genes, Baruch Hashem. They have a good upbringing. Their parents were very good. They grew up with good friends. There's no... So Baruch Hashem, they're nice gentlemen. So what do the rabbis mean? That there's no guarantee. There's no anchor to hold them back from Chaz Shalom going against what he always was and becoming a monster all of a sudden. There's no guarantee. <clears throat> Yes, some people are by nature nice, but there's no guarantee there's no Torah. So the Torah is an antidote against the Yetzel. The Torah holds us back. And yes, unfortunately, for those of you who may have something to say about religious people who are not always good and who are doing the wrong things, yes, what do you think? They don't have a Yetzel, huh? You know, I always tell these people who come over to me, did you hear? That rabbi was caught. He was doing this and he was doing that. I said, I said, of course. He said, of course? Yeah, he has a Yetzerara too. What do you think? Rabbis don't have a Yetzerara? We all have a Yetzerara. Some people <coughs> control him and some people don't. You know what this reminds me? When, when Nixon was caught in Watergate, you know what they said? All the presidents did the same thing he did, but he was caught. <laughs> That's the difference. No, they're all the same, but he was caught. Don't get caught. <laughs> right? So a lot of people have a weakness. This guy fell, and this guy doesn't fall. Yeah, some religious people fall. It, the religion doesn't guarantee for sure that you will not fall, but it helps. The Torah is a big help. Will it guarantee 100%? No, because you have to win. And sometimes the battles, we lose some battles. But as long as you're winning some of the days, some of the time, then you're okay. If you're always losing, you're in bad shape. So the Torah is really the only powerful antidote that we have to cool off the Yetzer. But sometimes that by itself is not enough. The person is really has so many problems and so many tavot and desire, he needs a lot of help. He needs a lot of help, tremendous amount of help. You know what they tell you when you're driving at night and you're tired? What should you do? The best thing is don't drive. <laughs> you're taking a risk, but you have no choice. You have to drive. Then drink a couple cups of coffee, uh, pull down the window so you get the air, right? And turn on the, the radio. Do something to keep you awake. And obviously, every so often, get off. You can do it. If you have to, you can do it. You have to force yourself. Sometimes the situations are very, very difficult. You need outside help. You need a rabbi. You need somebody to guide you. What do I do? I have this terrible spouse. And I say spouse because it could be their or. I don't know how to deal with her. You know, what well, do I to deal with him? What do you do? Very difficult person. You may not know on your own what to do. All the Torah will not help you. So seek advice. We don't know, have the answers to all the questions. Life is full of challenges. Yetzirah is, of course, a big problem. And if you don't know, even though you've studied, you may not know. Ask it, seek advice of others. That's okay. But remember, for men especially, the Torah is a very, very powerful way to get around the Yetzirah. I'd just like to finish with what we've been reading now in the Parshiot Shavua. In the Parshiot Shavua, we're talking about Paro. Since tonight we spoke a little bit about free will, we see how significant it is and how it's important <coughs> that we exercise our free will properly. But when reading about Paro, all of a sudden we see Hashem took away his free will. Right? That's this week's parasha. Parashat Bo. Hashem took away his free will? <laughs> we, we just spoke about how precious free will is. This, is. this is man's gift from Hashem. This is where he's different than the animal. Take it away from Paro? That's not fair. Maybe he would decide to release the Jews. You took it away from him? So there are many explanations given. I'm just going to go over a few with you. The Rambam says very clearly that sometimes Hashem does take away free will because that's the punishment that's coming to the wicked. 
if he on his own in the very, very beginning did not want to on his own, then Hashem says, eventually I'll take it away from you. Even if you want to, you won't be able to. So sometimes Hashem locks the gates of tshuva and doesn't make it easy for a person to do tshuva and takes away his free will. That's a punishment. It can happen. My Rebbe, one of my Rebbein, Rav Kahana Zechit Tzadik Lebracha, said that Paro received a punishment of taking his free will, midah kenege midah, an eye for an eye, measure for measure, because he took away the Jews' free will. By enslaving the Jews, you're taking the, their free will away. They're slaves. That's what's coming to you, too. You get your free will taken away. That's a punishment. I explained it a little bit differently, based on the Gemara that says that every day the Yetzirah renews itself and appears to you in different disguises. And if it would not be for Hashem helping you out, you would not be able to deal with it. In other words, that Gemara says that Kadosh Baruch Hu helps us with the Yetzirah. Without His help, we wouldn't be able on our own. How does Hashem help us? Through all kinds of ways we never even imagined. He distracts us. We, all of a sudden we get a phone call. All of a sudden we do something else. All of a sudden we, we cool off from this bad idea that we have. It's Mishamayim. Hashem does help. Without His help, we would not be able to do it. So what could be over here is that Hashem simply did not help at all. When Hashem takes away his involvement in a person's life, his ashgacha, then the individual begins to think, wait, well, maybe it is a coincidence. A whole bunch of locusts. After all, there are locusts. Right? <laughs> After all, they, are, they decided to come now. <laughs> so there is a way for man to begin to think that this is really nature. Hashem removes the impressionability of the man to think, oh, this is God. No, not necessarily. A lot of atheists are going to say it's a coincidence. Earthquakes? Oh, there's tectonic plates moving. Who said it's God? So if Hashem removes himself from helping you, then you lose that impressionability. And even though something shakes you up, you, after a while, after things come down, you say, hey, it's a coincidence. Every couple of years they come, these locusts. <laughs> So Hashem took away, that's one explanation. Then the, the explanation of the Siforna. There's other explanations. We don't have that much time to go into them. I just want to finish with what Rabbi tells in Pirkei Avot, Akol Tzafui Vareshut Netuna. Even though Hashem does know things in advance, it doesn't interfere with your free will. The Reshut is still given to you to decide what you want to do with it. Hashem knowing in advance will not interfere. He in no way does it interfere because the permission is still given because you have the permission to decide when it comes to the area of Yirat Shemayim. Hashem knowing that in no way interferes. Knowledge of Hashem is not in any way an interference. When it comes to making decisions in life, I just want to recommend that to be careful from ever, ever, ever coming close to doing what the people did in the Nuremberg trial. In the Nuremberg trial, every one of those Germans stood up and said, Nicht schuldig. I'm not guilty. I was just following orders. That's not a very good excuse. If you really, really know that something is wrong, if you really, really believe in something, you have the power to oppose it. You have the power to do that which is against it, that which you really, really believe. And we saw such stories in the Holocaust where there was a guy who charged for using his siddur a piece of your bread. That was terrible. On the other hand, you saw people who were willing to give away their bread to use that situr. So you have the negative, people see, you see how terrible this guy was using a situr to abuse, to take away people's bread to use a situr. Yes, but don't look at him. Look at the strength and the people who used their free will to make the right decision, to sacrifice. They didn't have to. That doesn't come from instincts. That was from choosing to value the situr even at the cost of giving away their bread. Look at the difference between how people make their decisions. And yet that's all maybe the will of Hashem that we make always the right decision. Amen. 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 Amen.